Okay, shall we dive in? Onward and upward. Um, this is introductory. A, summary of the journey so far. We started this journey in January, and we're calling it the geography of salvation. We're studying the map, and uh, we're preaching the map, just like Paul did in the New Testament. Um, the map that goes from Egypt, Red Sea, Sinai Peninsula, southern border of Canaan. Next week we'll get to, we can see Canaan from here, and they bring the fruit back. And the grapes are the size of softballs. I mean, it's like, it is a good land. But there's giants living on our property. So that's next week. Uh, and then around to the plains of Moab, across the Jordan River, Canaan. We, the map. It's in chapter 1. We talked about the map. That was back in January. Richard remembers. He's smiling at me. Um, it took three months to travel from the Red Sea to Sinai. So if you remember when we crossed the Red Sea and Miriam took her tambourine when she saw the dead Egyptians wash up in the surf and she said, I feel a song coming on. And she sang the horse and rider song. Then there were three months it took them to go down south the peninsula to get to Mount Sinai. And during those three months, we talked about University of the Desert. Anybody remember the five tests at U of D? Ah. Okay, test number one was the bitter place. What do you do when you're following the pillar of fire and God leads you to the bitter place? That's stop number one on the journey is the bitter place. It's like, that was, that was pretty much my favorite night so far. Uh, the, the second test was no food, so God can give you bread from heaven. Third test was no water. God can get water out of a rock. Fourth test was the Amalekites. Somebody in this desert wants to kill us. <laughs> so Moses said, all right, I'm going up on the mountain to pray. Joshua, you go down in the valley to fight. We talked about that test. And the fifth test was the administrative overload, where Moses was about to burn out. He was the senior pastor and had a church of two million members with no associate pastors on staff. <laughs> and he said, I'm not going to make it. And enter his father-in-law. It's a great thing to have a good father-in-law. Okay, so it took three months to get from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai. And it took us about five weeks as we did that part of the journey. Then number two, the people were camped at Sinai... I, I keep changing my numbers, but the bottom number is 12 months and the top number is 24. It, it depends on, I get different signals in scripture. Uh, I can't quite figure out how long they, but they were there for more than a year. The, the, the pillar of fire just stopped and three things happened at Mount Sinai. They got married to God. It's called the covenant and the law are part of that, but there was a marriage. Two, they got the tabernacle. They learned how to worship the Holy One. And then the third incident was what we looked at last week, was the golden calf. Bull in church. What do you do when there's bull in church? That's probably my second favorite. Yeah. Okay, so that's where we are today. So we've been out of Egypt about a year, maybe a year and a half. So B, finally, let's look at it, the pillar of fire, oh yeah, the blank on B, finally the pillar of fire lifts and the people are traveling again. So turn to Numbers chapter 10, and it takes a while to sort of figure out how these different books of the Pentateuch fit together, but it, uh, believe me, if I can do it, you can do it. I'm a, um, 
chapter 10, verse 11. No, I'm in Leviticus. That doesn't help. Numbers chapter 10, verse 11. In the second year, so we're at least 13 months in, in the second month, so that would be the 14th month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai. So you can read that, and it can sort of gloss over it before you realize this is important. It's been over a year, and now you can just feel the excitement in the camp. The cloud's moving. The cloud's moving. Pack your bags. You know, we're headed to Canaan, the land of milk and honey. So the excitement comes in the camp, and they're ready to go. So they're heading toward, I am bound toward the promised land. They're singing as they go. Okay. C, the distance from Mount Sinai to the border of Canaan, anybody know how far it is? Anybody want to guess? Less, I've got a less than, we could take uh, bets here, couldn't we? Less than 50, more than 50. My calculation is about 90, about 90 miles. But it's important to remember that number. That's from Mount Sinai. Find your map in the back of the Bible. You can, you can do the scale thing. You can try to figure it out. From Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. It's about 90 miles. How many days journey is that? Somebody look up Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 2. 11. Who's got it? 11. Where are you? Yes, read it to us. Uh, oh, well you're, yeah, you're, I put you on this spot. You're exactly right. It, it's so interesting that the book of Deuteronomy begins by reminding people who've been traveling 40 years that this journey only takes 11 days, <laughs> you 40-year wanderers. Read it. Read verse chap, Deuteronomy 1, verse 2. It takes 11 days to go from Horus to Kadesh to Nick Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. There you go. It's an 11-day journey, 90 miles. So when they're at Sinai and the cloud's moving, Theoretically, in 11 days, they're going to be eating milk and honey. I mean, this is, uh, okay. In other words, the people are now prepared and equipped to enter Canaan and begin to possess their inheritance. All right. I got interested in this footnote. Um, I don't know if you like footnotes or not, but. Footnotes are fun to produce, and uh, they're really fun to read if, if you've got an author who's really working with you. This, so what makes us prepared for Canaan? What makes us prepared for the abundant, victorious life? I put five things, if, if we're understanding the map. One, there's clear evidence of redemption. Are you really out of Egypt? Has the blood of the Lamb been shed and have you passed through the waters of baptism? That's how Paul talks in the New Testament, the baptism of Moses. So you can't get into Canaan unless you first got out of Egypt. So number two, the five tests at Desert U. Learning to trust God in bitter places, with provision, with protection, and for administrative demands. Three, entering into a covenant, a marriage covenant with God. Four, learning how to live and walk with the Holy One. That's the tabernacle in worship. And then number five is learning how to deal with sin in the camp. What do you do when there's bull in camp? Um, so I think God is telling us if, if you've got these basic ingredients in your life, you're ready to possess your inheritance. You're ready to enter into the abundance of victory 
that Christ died to make possible. I think there's a lot of theology in that. All right, I'm going to keep moving. D, the book of Numbers. Because for the next few weeks, we're going to be in Numbers. We finished Exodus. Now we're in Numbers. And then when we finish Numbers, we're going to spend one or two weeks in Deuteronomy. And then we're going to spend one or two weeks in the first two chapters of Joshua. And then you can be dismissed for summer vacation. <laughs> but I don't want to leave you in the desert. We're going to get across the Jordan to the Battle of Jericho. That's where I plan to leave you. Once we get to Jericho, you can see your inheritance, and you should be in good shape. Just go possess your, possess your inheritance. Uh, the book of Numbers. This book describes the journey from Sinai to the border of Canaan the plains of Moab, and explains why a two-year journey took 40 years to complete. Because that's the big question. You know, why in the Sam Hill did a 90-mile a trip take these folks 40 years? I am so glad you asked. And it's the very same reason why many people who sit on pews in evangelical churches know their Bibles, sing their songs, and they do the same stupid stuff and do laps year after year, and their lives never get past ground zero. And they spend a generation, they spend a lifetime just doing laps in the wilderness. And sometimes the guy in the pulpit says, don't worry about it, that is the normal Christian life. That's as good as it gets. You have to die and go to heaven before you can enter into your inheritance. It's like, uh, I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, number two, though the book of Numbers includes instructions for laws, offerings, feasts, cities of refuge, Levites, a census, which is why it's called the book of Numbers by, for example, it's called Numbers because there's two Census in there. What's the plural for census? <laughs> there was one census early in the book. There's another census later in the book. Um, and that's why it's called Numbers. So there's a lot of sort of tedious stuff in the book. But our study will focus on a number of key events that occurred during this phase of the journey. So some of the most interesting stories in the Old Testament are actually in numbers, but you sort of got to look for them. The one tonight we're going to look at where the people say we want meat to eat and uh, they eat, we're going to talk about the quail story. This is, this is a very good story. Next week is Kadesh Barnea. That's where the 12 spies are sent and they come back with a bad report. They say it's a good land, but we can't take it. Those people are bad dudes over there. And we're just humble little slaves redeemed from bondage. So we're going to just keep walking in circles in the desert. Uh, uh, two weeks from tonight, oh, incidentally, we're not meeting next week. I will not be here next week. I will send you an email, uh, but I'm doing a revival next week at Orangeburg or up near Ruggles somewhere, if I can find it on the map. <laughs> um, but Korah's rebellion, this is the story where the earth opens up and swallows people. I mean, it's like, that, that's a good story. Um, Moses sinned when he struck the rock. And God says, Moses, you can't even go in. Then the snake story. I, um, uh, we may deal with the talk, talking donkey story uh, uh, Balaam's donkey, which pretty much my favorite character in the whole Bible is Balaam's donkey. Uh, and then chapter 25 is the Moabite women. When you're on the journey, watch out for Moabite women. <laughs> they'll, they'll take you down. And uh, it, it's a serious story. Baal of Peor. It's the, what happened with the Moabite women who seduced the Hebrew men. 
you won't get in Canaan if you get entangled with the Moabite woman. I'm, I'm, I don't mean to pick on Moabites, but... Uh, okay, does that work? So that's what we're doing. We're just taking our time through the map. It's just... All right. The crazy cycle. Look at Le Romans 11. Now, I could... I don't want to get stuck here. I want to do this quick. I almost skipped these verses and just started at verse 4. I'm at Numbers 11, but let me read you verses 1, 2, and 3. And the people, what? We've seen this before. The grumblers, the murmurers, the complainers. So the pillar of fire is leading them, and the people are whining as they go. The people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. It's so hot. We're tired of this manna. You know, are we there yet? Um, and when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. Every parent of a teenager understands this scenario. Um, I was reminded in my notes today of a Irma Bombeck story <laughs> when uh, she writes a book about taking their kids on vacation and her you know, and her teenager is in the back seat says, Mom, did you have to wake me up just to see the Grand Canyon? <laughs> it's, a, it's like, that's what God feels. You know, I brought you to the Grand Canyon. It's cost me money and time. And yes, you've got to wake up. Look at it and enjoy it. Let me take a smile for your picture. Anyway, and the fire of the Lord burned against them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So the name of that place was called Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Let me just uh, show you what I've done here, and just mention it and keep moving. This incident seems to be a kind of summary statement I don't think it's just a single event. I think Moses is writing this because this is typical. This is not atypical. This is sort of daily life of an ongoing pattern of dysfunction. Pattern of dysfunction that characterized the people of God on their journey. And uh, I just sort of invented this I just, I'm calling it the crazy cycle. In um, Egerich's book on marriage, um, yeah, Love and Respect, you, you know that book, but he talks about the crazy cycle. Well, this is similar. And it goes like this. You can start anywhere on the circle. So God is leading you, but you don't like how he's leading you, so the people grumble and complain. When the people grumble and complain, God gets angry and sends judgment. In this case, he sends fire. Then when God judges his people, they get penitent and say, okay, we're sorry, God, please forgive us. <laughs> and God says, okay, I'll forgive you. Uh, and let's be reckoned, let's kiss and make up. And then God starts leading them again. And then they grumble and complain again. God sends judgment they repent, and this goes over and over and over. And sometimes it defines a lifetime. Two important questions. Does this crazy cycle describe the normal Christian life? I'll give you my short answer to this. No. <laughs> But it does describe the life many of us live. But we shouldn't. Is this the best we can hope for in this life? And number two, is breaking this crazy cycle the key to entering Canaan? In other words, how do I stop doing laps in the desert and cross the Jordan and possess my inheritance? Well, somehow I've got to break the craziness of this cycle that just says I, I, I mess up, God forgives me, 
I try again, I mess up again, God forgives me again, and we just sort of limp along until we die and go to heaven, and then we get fixed. Is, is that how it works? I hope not. I hope that's why I think preaching the map is so important, because it really gives you the ability to talk about how do I get out of these cycles of dysfunction. Okay, let's read, hey, we're doing good. This is, I think this is good. Let me read you this whole chapter. This is really a good chapter. Numbers chapter 11, starting at verse 4. It's the quail story. Um, and it's got some humor in it, if you uh, like Jewish humor, <laughs> which I happen to like. Okay. Now the rabble that was among them had a what? What word do you have? Craving. Craving. What other words? I can't hear. Greedy desire. Intense craving. So there's this appetite, this desire. It's, it's, it's not necessarily... A bad desire, but when desire gets focused on the wrong things, Houston, we have a problem. Okay. They had a strong craving, and what they want is meat and something other than manna. It's appetite. And the people of Israel wept again and said, oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish in Egypt. Oh, remember the fish? Can you smell it? You, you could just, you could, this would be such fun to produce as a movie. The, the fish we ate in Egypt, that cost us nothing. We got free food in Egypt. Of course you did. You were slaves. Slaves. Don't, that's why it was free. You know, where's your memory? And the cucumbers. Oh, and the melons. The leeks, the onions, oh, and the garlic. Oh, my goodness, I miss the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all to look at but this stupid manna. Stinking manna. I, I threw in the word stupid and stinking, all right? Any translations that you had as I read that? Do you get the picture? So it's been about two years since they've been out of Egypt. And they're hallucinating. <laughs> Their taste buds are going wild. And, uh, and uh, okay, verse 10. We, we can skip verses 7 to 9. It well, it describes what manna is. And it says it, manna tastes like cakes baked with oil, which I'm not sure what that's like, but manna is pretty bland. It's not Mexican. It's not Thai. It's not spicy. There's no fish thrown in it or hamburger meat. It's just manna. But it is perfect food for the desert. It is nourishing. It will get you through the desert. Um, we talked about limbus, didn't we? Luke knows. Limbus is in Lord of the Rings. It's what Sam and Frodo ate. The elves gave them Limbus. Uh, doesn't have much flavor, but it'll make you strong. It'll strengthen the will. It's what, yeah. Okay. Um, verse 10. Moses heard the people weeping. So picture two million whiny, cry people, and you're the pastor. <laughs> Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly. And Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt till ill with your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive this people 
Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing, nursing child to the land that you swore to give to their fathers? Where am I to get meat for two million people in the Sinai Peninsula? <laughs> That's a pretty good question. What am I supposed to do? For they weep before me and say, give us meat. I'm not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you're going to treat me like this, just kill me at once. <laughs> if I found favor in your sight, that I may not see my own wretchedness. That's quite a speech. Um, okay, you got the picture? Then the Lord said to Moses, so here's God's solution. Gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you. So we're going to redistribute the load. I'm not going to take the burden away. We're just going to spread the, the weight. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you may not bear it alone yourself. Verse 18. And say to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat. You want meat? I'll give you meat. Uh, you shall not eat just one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out your nostrils. <laughs> I love to read that verse in church. Kids in church love it when you read that verse. It's like... Uh, and becomes loathsome to you because you've rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we come out of Egypt? But Moses said, the people among whom I am, the people among whom I am number 600,000 men on foot. Okay, so if there's 600,000 adult men, if each one has a wife, if each couple has two or three kids, that's where I come up with two million people. So Moses is saying, the, I, I'm, I'm among 600,000 men, and you've said, I'll give them meat for a whole month? <laughs> shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them and be enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them? and be enough for them? In other words, God, not even you can pull this one off. You, th this is too big even for omnipotence. You can't feed two million people with meat in the Sinai Peninsula. It just can't be done. And the Lord said to Moses, Is my arm too short? <laughs> now you shall see whether my word will come true or not. This is such a good story. It's like, you just watch me, Moses. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders, and the people placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took some of the spirit that was on Moses and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad. Those are two great names for your kids or grandkids, Eldad and Medad. And the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they hadn't gone out to the tent. So they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran up and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth said, My Lord Moses, stop him. But Moses said, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. And Moses and the elders returned to the camp. 
Verse 31. Then a wind from the Lord sprang up and brought what? Quail. quail. Moses had not thought of quail. He had thought of sheep and goats and fish. Nobody had ever thought of quail. I don't, I don't know how many people ate quail in those days. And it, the wind brought quail from the sea and let them fall beside the camp about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on that side around the camp about two cubits above the ground. How far is a day's journey? Let's be conservative. Let's say 10 miles. That's conservative, I think. So if you go 10 miles that way, 10 miles that way, 10 miles that way, 10 miles that way, that would make 20 mile dimensions. That means 400 square miles. Is my math right? And how deep are the quail? Two cubits is about three feet. So what you've got are 400 square miles, if my, if my math is right, 400 square miles of quail three feet deep. Which translates, uh, verse 32, and the people rose all the next day and all the next night and gathered the quail. Those who gathered the least gathered 10 omers. That's 60 bushels. So, 200, 2 million people, every person gets 60 bushels of quail apiece. It's like, God, this is, this is overkill. This, he's, and I think God said, you said you wanted meat. It, it is an incredibly funny story. What's that? The quail didn't have a vote. <laughs> okay. Um, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. Verse 33. While the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord struck down the people with a great plague. Therefore, the name of that place was called Kibroth. Hatava. What's your footnote say? Graves of craving. I think that's what's going to be on your tombstone. You craved it, you got it, and it killed you. When you got what your soul was passionate to possess, it killed you. This will preach. This is real stuff. Because they had buried the people who had the craving. From Kibroth Hatava, the people journeyed to Hazaroth, and they remained at Hazaroth. All right, let's try to make a few applications here. This is. Uh... Where's the beef? That's a little dated, but I, uh... that's what they're asking. What is the problem? Describe the problem. One, the people have a strong craving for meat and for the food they once had in Egypt. Cucumbers, fish, leeks, onions, melons, garlic. They are hungry for the wrong things. They should be hungry for milk and honey. That's what their appetite should be focused on. But their appetite is for the food of this world, for Egyptian food. They are weary, number two, and bored with wonder bread that God gives them every day. I mean, every morning they walk out and gather free, free, free food. And they say, we're tired of that. I can understand why God gets angry. It's a, you're tired of that? It's wonder bread. It's free. It'll get you to Canaan. It's from me to you. I chose it for you. Yeah, but it doesn't have garlic in it. Um, they're weary and bored with the life God is providing them. 
Though nutritious and perfectly suited for desert life, manna is rather bland in taste. I'd like to say more. Let's keep moving. When the people grumble and complain, they set in motion once again, again the crazy cycle. Right up there at the top of the page. They're, they're just stuck in that insanity of the crazy cycle. This means they're not ready to enter Canaan, and they may well spend their entire lives doing laps in the wilderness. <clears throat> like many people do. Like many people do. They have enough faith to get out of Egypt, but not enough faith to get into Canaan. And so they just do laps. And if they develop a theology that says, that's okay, that's as good as it gets, then you're home free. That's why I'm on the war path and why I want to preach the map. It's like, don't stay in the desert. It's not your home. Spiritual principle. The Bible is a food-driven book. How did sin enter the world? Through fruit. Through food. How does salvation enter the world? Through food. I am the bread of life. This is my body, broken for you. Eat. It's a, all about food. It's all about your appetites. What are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? The Bible is a food-driven book, and successful completion of our journey hinges on whether our craving for the milk and honey of Canaan is stronger than our craving for the leeks and onions of Egypt. Ruth, what are you smiling at? You're chuckling on that one. I'm, I'm, I'm want to know what you're thinking. What's that? I think leeks and garlic. Yeah. I first uh, remember it's a Jewish garlic. Yeah. Yeah. It smelled on people's breath. Ah, yeah. Good. Quentin, yeah, this is. Does milk and honey have, is that symbolic of more than just the actual milk and honey? That's a great question, and I'm, I don't really know the answer. Quentin is asking, is there, what's the symbolism, if any, of milk and honey, and leeks and onions and garlic and melons, too? And um, I don't think I'm taking license with the text to do what I'm doing. Now, I don't know how to answer that question, but I know the food of this world and the food of God's kingdom, the city of man, the city of God, and where are my appetites? Those are very real questions. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Soup beans three times a day is like manna. <laughs> My understanding of manna, it, when you think about your appetite, like how? Let me start again. There was a time in my life, if, I've, if you've heard me say this, forgive me, but there was a time in my life when I was a kid, if you'd have given me a choice, Stan, would you rather go to McDonald's or Dakota Steakhouse? I would have said McDonald's. I, hands down. I mean, that's, it, what, doesn't everybody? But then my, I, educated my palate enough to realize that's not really a good choice because Dakota Steakhouse beats McDonald's all over the place. We all know that. And when your palate is educated enough to understand to actually, I'd rather have a steak than a quarter pounder with cheese. <laughs> you know, that's, I really would. I'd rather do that. We, we get that. I think what's happened when, to get out of Egypt we really do like leeks and onions. Garlic is, that's good stuff. It, it, it does. It's, 
that's why God chooses it. It's very appealing. So you've got to cleanse your palate. And I think manna cleanses the palate. It's when you go to Korea, they give you those ginger beans or something. Is What is it they eat? Uh, Dan knows it or he's, he's anyway, but the, and I said, what is that on the table? And they said, well, you, it cleanses your palate so you can have new tastes, but you've got to cleanse your palate. Uh, does that make sense? So I think that's what, when they're redeemed, God says, now you eat manna for a couple of years and it'll get all that leeks and onions out of your system. Because that's, that's the world. That's, that's the things of this world. And to the point where all you can think of is the milk and honey and the food of God. I love the things of God. I mean, yeah. It's appetites. So how do I get pure appetites? That is a real question. Who, who am I missing? Susie? I, I mean, I was asked that a little while ago, but I was kind of embarrassed because I'm like, I should know what milk and honey is. Like, I should know that. And I kept wondering until he asked it. But it's like, you Very much so. Very much so. Do you remember uh, Keith Green? <laughs> I actually Googled it this afternoon because I, I got the song in my... So you want to go back to Egypt. It's, it's, this is 1970s uh, Christian rock uh, that is just my era, but Keith Green, who died young, it's, it's Keith Green's an, an amazing story, but he wrote this song, uh, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt, and he just, he talks about uh, garlic breath and manna souffle, I mean, it, it is a very funny song, but it's about, why would you want to go back to Egypt? It's bondage. Well, because I like garlic, you know, that's why I want to go, but well, think about what you're doing. I mean, this really preaches. I, it's such good material. It's, but Google Keith Green, you want it, so you want to go back to Egypt. I, I should have played it. it it's like an Ichthus rock festival, the one I had. And it's, it, yeah, it took me back a few years. Luke is with me tonight. Thank you, bud. All right, B. So we've seen, first of all, the problem. So what are the results of the problem? One, well, for the people... The results are this, craving Egyptian food and grumbling about God's provision will make people miserable and keep them doing laps in the desert forever. So, some may even want to abandon the journey altogether and go back to Egypt. Next week, we're going to see when they come back with the bad report and say we can't take our inheritance because of the giants camping on it. They want to elect a new leader and go back to Egypt. The results for God are this. Every parent knows something of what this feels like. Twice the text says that the whining of the people caused God to feel great anger. This is not the first time the redeemed have complained about God's care and provision. At what point will God's patience end how long is God's fuse? That is a good question. Now he's going to tell Moses, he told Moses, I'm slow to anger. I've got a long fuse. But you think what's been going on since redemption. Uh, God, they grumbled about the bitter water. They grumbled about no food. They grumbled about the Amalekites. They grumbled at the golden, they built a golden calf. They committed adultery with a bull six weeks after the honeymoon. I mean, how long is God's fuse? <laughs> when is God going to say, you want to go back to Egypt? Just 
go back to Egypt. You, I'm done. Because there is a limit. A limit to what? A limit to his grace? I don't, I don't think so, but my spirit will not strive with man forever, God says. Don't push me too far. It's what every parent of a teenager <laughs> understands this. Don't push me too far. You'll be sorry. Don't do it. Um, okay, for Moses, what are the consequences? This congregation has pushed Moses' limits before. This time seems to almost push him over the edge. Where am I to get meat for so many people? I can't carry the burden anymore. It's too heavy. His frustration is so great, he wants to die. He basically says, God, just do me a favor and kill me now. <laughs> Most pastors I know have been at that point at some time or other. Just this, this, I didn't sign up for this. I did not sign up for two million whiny babies, you know. Spiritual principle. Grumbling and complaining is a deadly sin. It is not in any of the lists of seven deadly sins that I've ever read, but it is a killer in the Bible, grumbling, a bitter spirit. It angers God and is a major source of discouragement to ministry leaders. Craving that which God forbids keeps us doing laps in the desert forever. Solution. Very interesting solution. And um, God never answers the problem the way I think he ought to answer the problem. How would you answer the problem? Okay, the problem is the people want meat. If you were God, what, how would you have handled that? Forget it. <laughs> okay. Just, just no way. No way, Jose. That would make sense. He doesn't, that's not what he does. Any other thoughts on what would you do what, if you were a parent? Paulette? He, he does make them work for it, though. I mean, he, he gives them all of this, but he makes them work for it. He's got to walk out of the camp. They've got to do everything. They've got to haul it all back. Hey. He's uh, got a sense of humor. <laughs> I, well, let, I've got two things that I think he does to resolve the problem. For Moses, number one, God's solution is to delegate ministry responsibility to others, to share the load. Perhaps Moses was hoping that God would solve the problem of ministry by removing it. God said no. He solved it by distributing the weight. We need 70 men here, 70 good men, and let's share the load. Let's get elders. Let's get deacons. Let's, um, but the most interesting solution is what he does with the people. So the people say, we want meat. I mean, God could have just said, nope, not going to give you any. He could have tried to talk, rationalize with them and say, can we talk about this? Do you, he, there are several things he could have done. But what he does is, he says, you want meat? I'm going to give you what you want. And you're going to regret it. And again, this is exactly the conversation that parents have with teenagers. <laughs> I'm going to give you what you want, and you're going to be so sorry. Because you don't, yeah. Okay, here we go. For the people, God's solution is surprising. He gives the people what they want. He lets them have their way. I remember when I was a high school senior, I talked my parents into letting me go to Panama City on spring break. And that was not a good thing to do. But I badgered them for weeks. 
Because they said, no, you're not going. No, you're not going. No, you're not going. And finally they said, go. And I wish I hadn't. I think that's part of the dynamic. You want meat? You sure you want meat? And, and God's angry. I mean, I'll, I'll give you meat. I'll give you 400 square miles up to your thighs so everybody can have 60 bushels for 30 days. It'll come out your noses. There. You happy? No. <laughs> yeah. He lets them have their way. He lets them fill their stomachs with what they crave. You want meat? You really want meat? I'll give you meat. Not even Moses believed that God could pull off a miracle of this scale. The people got what they craved. They ate so much quail that it came out their nostrils and became loathsome to them. If you've watched Chronicles of Narnia, Turkish delight, you know, Turkish delight is what Edmund wants. He wants to eat Turkish delight, but if you eat too much of it, it just, it, it's awful. It's a, you really want God to let you have what you want? Are you sure? Um, now, see, with the quail came a great plague. D, Moses ensured that this tragic story would be remembered by giving a new name to the place where this incident occurred. Graves of Craving. Speaking of this incident many years later, the psalmist wrote, quote, But they had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test. He gave them what they asked, but sent a wasting disease among them. He said yes to your prayer, but with the answer came a disease. It's like, yeah, hold on. <laughs> but the drama of this is not that the drama is that is exactly what the people said they wanted and God is letting people have their way which I think and this is really the point of the whole story is what hell is hell is a location created precisely for those who insist on having their own way. I did it my way. Frank's is the national anthem of hell. You know, that's Frank Sinatra that will sing it forever. Is that really what you want, Frank? To step into eternity just doing it your way? Are you sure? Um... Paul's F, Paul's description of divine judgment in Romans 1, 18 to 32, is of God letting sinners have what they want. Three times, Paul describes how God gave them over. That's the phrase, he gave them over. But it means he, he, he gave them what they said they wanted. And this is what they said they wanted. Sexual impurity, shameful lusts, and a depraved mind. And God said, after moving slowly, God finally said, if that's really what you want, you can have that forever. Final judgment will be when God says, if that's what you want, that's what you'll get. Spiritual principle, be careful what you ask for. Final judgment for sinners will be the moment God gives them what they've always demanded. That is a pretty good study. That is good stuff. Jim, go. The Tenth Commandment. Excellent. Thou shalt not covet. Crave. 
Make, make sure your cravings are on the right things. It's not our cravings that are wrong, it's what they're focused on. C.S. Lewis writes a lot about this. He says, we, our, he says our cravings aren't strong enough. We need stronger cravings, but they've got to be focused on the milk and honey kind of things, not the leeks and onions. Gosh, you haven't said anything tonight. That's all right. I put you on the spot. Hey, yeah. That's good. Have you ever eaten a quail? Yeah. About ten bites. Yeah, they're just. <laughs> one, uh, one preaching I heard on this once, uh, it pointed out the sanitary conditions that uh, would differ from eating yeah. manna all the time, which probably was totally consumed, versus the waste. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> It's an amazing story. I, uh, and I think with stories like this, the point is just don't, just keep thinking about it. It's just let it be, a, it's a story. And the moral is sort of obvious, but it's sort of not obvious too. It's like, Lord, what, and especially the question, what are you trying to say to me? And what am I craving? And what am I asking for that you're telling me no that I'm not happy with, and but maybe your no is protecting me from things I don't know I need protection from. Ruth. Have you sacrificial system not been put in place at this point? Because in the peace offering that Diane said, the people ate the peace offering. So they would have had to eat once in a while if the sacrifice. They, they, they had just started, I guess, at Sinai. See, that's what they were learning to do. And then the book, of course, of Leviticus is all about those offerings. That's a good point. So they did get to eat meat. Anyway. Lord, thank you so much for your word. It's such a treasure, and these stories are just priceless. And we pray you'd continue to let the story just work its way into our mind, into our hearts and imaginations, and most of all, help us apply it in our own lives and where we're asking or we're craving things that we shouldn't crave. Lord, would you cleanse our palate so that our desires are that which, is, that which is true and noble and right and good and holy, that we would set our mind on things above and not on things on earth, and that our appetites would be a healthy appetites and a, would, would protect us from the things of this world that would destroy us and bring a plague into our lives and into our families. Dismiss us with your peace. Keep us safe as we travel to our homes tonight and keep teaching us. Don't give up on us and help us in our journey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> no study next Tuesday. I'll, I'll send you an email, okay? <laughs> <laughs>